the treasures of Solomon's temple, probably the most valuable hidden treasure on the earth. Has Jeremiah the prophet's secret hiding place for these things been located? And does an ancient copper scroll give the location? A treasure map to 170 tons of buried treasure. Proof of Israel's claim to the Temple Mount? Will it be the future dowry of the bride hidden for the Messiah? Are the vessels used in Solomon's temple like the Ark of the Covenant included? And does an ancient Dead Sea Scroll made out of copper hold the clues to all these things? The Copper Scroll Treasure. Mystery, intrigue, and end time impact. This episode has it all, so keep watching. Today we are talking about something so scintillating, so exciting, it deserves our full attention. Were vessels and treasures from the temple buried to protect them? And even more exciting, do some of these treasures date back to Solomon's temple? And were they buried by Jeremiah the prophet himself? It appears that both answers are yes. A special ground scanning detector for precious metals has been used in the area that is suspected. And guess what? It indicates that without a shadow of a doubt that huge amounts of gold and silver are buried at this site. Yet the Israeli government and the antiquities departments know about this but are doing nothing. But before we get into all this, let's take a step or two backwards and start at the beginning. The Copper Scroll, the treasure map at the center of this excitement and controversy is after all, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. As you may already know, in 1948, a Bedouin shepherd was in the area of the ruins of Qumran on the western shore of the Dead Sea. One of his sheep had wandered into a cave on the cliffside, and to scare him out, the shepherd threw a rock into the cave. The rock made the sound of shattering pottery when it landed, which intrigued the shepherd. It turned out that the pottery was a jar, and that there were several ancient pottery jars in this cave, all of which contained old scrolls of parchment. Today, we know these as the Dead Sea Scrolls. The shepherd did not know the value of what he had. After presenting them to several dealers who were unwilling to purchase them, the Bedouin eventually sold seven scrolls, some to a cobbler named Kondo, and three others to a dealer, all for seven Jordanian pounds, or $321 in 2019 currency. Obviously, the deal of the century for the dealers who bought the scrolls. The initial seven scrolls were found in a cave that came to be known as Cave One. Eventually, scrolls would be found in 12 caves and over 900 separate documents dating from 300 BC to the first century were discovered. These scrolls had amazing biblical importance. Prior to this discovery, the knee-jerk reaction of skeptics was to say, eh, the Bible was no longer in its original form, that the constant process of making copies had resulted in great changes over time. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls ended that debate on the spot, showing that only minor changes had occurred to the Old Testament over the past 2,000 years. In addition to books of the Bible, the 900 documents contain numerous non-biblical texts, like commentaries on the books of the Bible that show how first century Jews thought about the scriptures, etc. We will do videos on some of the most important ones in the coming weeks. But let's return to the Copper Scroll. It was found in cave number three. During the centuries of history, the ceiling of cave three had collapsed severely damaging the parchment scrolls in it. However, this didn't damage the copper scroll. Almost like out of a James Bond movie, the copper scroll was safely hidden behind a false wall in the cave on a man-made shelf. And being made out of copper, it had survived the centuries. It was immediately intriguing to the archeologists when the first words on the outside of the scroll that they were able to translate were gold, Q, 
cubits and dig. They knew instantly it was a treasure map. The scroll was carefully sectioned and opened with a number of unusual workshop items, including dental tools of all things. And then it was cleaned. Only then its mysterious contents could be read. When the scroll was translated, it was unlike all the other Dead Sea Scrolls. It's not a literary work. It has no plot. It has no characters, but a list of places where various items of gold, gems, and silver were buried or hidden. And the amount of the treasure was astronomical. This large amount of gold caused many archaeologists to at first doubt the scroll. How could the first century occupants of Qumran, which was out in the desert, have had billions of dollars of precious metal? The answer was they probably didn't. But the temple in Jerusalem might have. When the Romans sacked the temple in AD 70, Josephus tells us so much gold was looted that when it flooded the market, it affected the price of gold worldwide, lowering the price dramatically. In Solomon's day, we learned that silver was as common as rocks. So if the gold and silver at Qumran is temple gold, the real value of these things isn't their worth in gold or silver, but what these things are, the temple vessels, and possibly the furniture from the temple of God itself. How can you place a price on things like that? But people try. A few years ago, a small ornamental pineapple surfaced on the market with the inscription, the house of Yehovah. A Jewish museum paid $500 million for it, only to find that the inscription was a fraud. You see, not one single item from either Solomon's temple or from the second temple exists today. Can you imagine the value, both monetarily and to the nation of Israel and believers, if these items were to be found? Let's begin to consider what it might mean to uncover even a small number of these items. First and least important is the financial value. If a small pineapple with an inscription was worth $500 million, what might a ceremonial bowl used in actual temple worship be worth? $5 billion? And what about the ephod or ceremonial vestment of the high priest set with 12 precious stones? What might it be worth? Because one is supposed to be buried. Might it be worth a trillion dollars? Of course, money is insignificant when we discuss the historical, political, and spiritual value of these items. Imagine the effect on the faith of billions to actually see it with their eyes. Items discussed in the Bible, to know that the Bible is completely accurate in its description of these things. And imagine the political impact of finding these items. They would be the title deed, so to speak, to the Temple Mount and Jerusalem for the Israelites. Proof positive that there was a temple and that the historic ownership of it belonged to the Jews. Now, believe it or not, those who oppose Jewish ownership of Israel and Jerusalem actually cast doubt that there was ever a Jewish nation. As crazy as that seems to Christians, this is a common excuse in the secular or non-believing world. However, if actual temple vessels and vestments were recovered, well, that would silence forever the notion that there was never a temple, just as the Dead Sea Scrolls silenced forever the notion that the Bible has changed over time since the first century. And as we will learn later, perhaps the political ramifications of these items is all that is holding the Israelis back from digging them up. But more on that later in our second video on this topic. For now, let's examine the Copper Scroll itself and what it says. The first translator of the scroll suggested the Copper Scroll was a separate deposit from the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls, separated by what he called a lapse in time. 
that it wasn't the work of the Essenes who lived in Qumran, but could have been produced earlier. The writing style on this scroll is unusual, very unusual, different from all the other scrolls that have been found. It is written in a style similar to Mishnaic Hebrew, but not exactly. The majority of ancient Hebrew texts found in Qumran are generally biblical in nature, but the Copper Scroll is not. It's a treasure map, and as a result, much of the vocabulary is not found in the Bible or anything else we have found from ancient times. So, although scholars believe the Copper Scroll is from the same basic time period as the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls, maybe it isn't. Maybe it is far, far older. Rather than being the writing of the Jews in AD 70 then, hiding the temple treasures from the Romans, might it be the writings of Jews 600 years removed, hiding treasures from Solomon's temple from the Babylonians? Wow, what if that is true? Could this be the treasure from Solomon's temple and be 2,600 years old? That is certainly possible because the scroll was hidden behind a false wall. The wall might have hidden the scroll from the Essenes who lived there during the Second Temple period. And being produced on copper, it would have had the ability to survive all those years. So is there any evidence any evidence at all, this could be true. Well, first, Jewish archaeologists Megan and Peleg claimed the site of Qumran was occupied in the first temple period, writing in the Judea Samaria publications. They said Qumran was first settled toward the late 8th or early 7th century BCE and remained in existence until the destruction of the first temple. So Jews were there during the time of Solomon's temple. Second, Josephus, the historian, has stated that the main treasure of the temple was still in the building when it fell to the Romans. If you remember earlier in the video, we discussed that the amount of gold that flooded the market after the fall of Jerusalem was so great that it affected the price of gold worldwide. Also, the Arch of Titus, a famous artifact in Rome, shows a number of temple articles being taken into Rome, including the menorah. Would Jews have left behind the menorah? So these facts point to it being unlikely that the second temple treasures were spared. This means the treasure on the Copper Scroll might more likely be first temple treasure which would be historically and spiritually even more valuable. Also, scholars have pointed out that other Dead Sea Scrolls are very critical of the priesthood of the Second Temple, just as Jesus was. Would these corrupt priests have trusted the Essenes, who were so critical of them to protect their temple treasures? This also seems unlikely. Then. There are the accounts of Jeremiah hiding the temple treasures from Solomon's temple. Let's start to consider these ancient records. All of these accounts and records come from non-biblical books back from the second temple period. Can we trust them? Well, no, they're not the Bible when it comes to doctrine. However, they could contain accurate historical information we should not completely dismiss them if we consider them the equivalent of any other history book at that time period. What they say is very, very interesting. In the book of 2 Maccabees from the Apocrypha in the King James Bible, there is an account about Jeremiah. The book describes how the prophet hid the holy objects of the temple to protect them from the Babylonians. The same document also describes how the prophet, warned by an oracle, gave orders for the tent and the ark to go with him, and he set out for the mountain which Moses had climbed to survey God's heritage. 
On his arrival, Jeremiah found a cave dwelling, into which he put the tent, the ark, and the altar of incense, afterward blocking up the entrance. So first we see that a document existed at one time that detailed Jeremiah being told by God to hide the treasures of Solomon's temple from the Babylonians. Notice this included both the tent or the tabernacle and the ark. In Acts 15:16, James quotes the prophet Amos. After these things, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. To me, this seems to indicate that it might be the Messiah who finally discovers these items, or at least the tent, because he seems to set it up after his return. And I'm sure you did notice what else was hidden by Jeremiah, the ark and the altar of incense. Maccabees indicates Jeremiah set out for Mount Nebo, where Moses had climbed prior to Israel entering the Holy Land. If Jeremiah left Jerusalem on his way to Nebo, notice that Qumran is on the same route, just about an hour south of the route from Jerusalem to Nebo. Maccabees continues, Some of his companions went back later to mark out the path, but were unable to find it. When Jeremiah learned this, he reproached them and said the place is to remain unknown. He said until God gathers his people together again and shows them his mercy, then the Lord will bring these things once more to light and the glory of the Lord will be seen and so will the cloud as it was revealed in the time of Moses and when Solomon prayed that the holy place might be gloriously hallowed. So Maccabees indicates these items will only be uncovered upon the return of Jesus, which seems to confirm the book of Acts. Baruch was Jeremiah's scribe in the pseudo-figurical book, The Apocalypse of Baruch. It records the hiding of the temple furniture and vessels. And I saw him descend into the Holy of Holies and take from there the veil, the holy ark, the mercy seat, and the two tables, and the holy raiment of the priests, and the altar of incense, and the forty-eight precious stones wherewith the priest was adorned, and all the holy vessels of the tabernacle. Notice that this account adds to the items taken by Jeremiah. Baruch continues, And he spoke to the earth with a loud voice, Earth, 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 hear the word of the mighty God, and receive what I commit to you, and guard them until the last times, so that when you are ordered you may restore them, so that strangers may not get possession of them. For the time comes when Jerusalem will also be delivered for a time, until it is said that it is again restored forever. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up. So are these books recording the actual protection of the treasures of Solomon's temple? These are not biblical books, but they certainly are interesting and could be historically accurate, especially because the Copper Scroll seems to indicate the hiding place of many of these same items. Now the Copper Scroll has several unusual features. First of all, it is based on four different handwriting styles. We can see that it was engraved by four different scribes. Ancient sources indicate who these men might have been that wrote the Copper Scroll. Two of them were prophets from the Bible, Haggai and Zechariah. That information is shocking and adds an even greater sense of awe to the Copper Scroll. Five names, four writers and a leader, come from two separate sources. One is a 17th century rabbinic book called The Valley of the King. The second document is really two marble tablets from the prophet Ezekiel's tomb located in Iraq. These tablets name the same five men. Here's what the records state. These records were written by five righteous men. They are Shemur the Levite, Hezekiah, Zedekiah, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah the son of Edo the prophet. They concealed the vessels of the temple and the wealth of the treasures that were in Jerusalem 
which will not be discovered until the day of the coming Mashiach, son of David, speedily in our time. Amen. And so it will be. And here's where that record gets even more interesting. These are the holy vessels and the vessels of the temple that were in Jerusalem and in every place. They were inscribed by Shemar, the Levite and his companions on a copper plate. These records predate the finding of the copper scroll by in one case hundreds of years and in the other thousands of years. So the mention of a copper scroll or copper plate is astounding. So why were four writers used? Was this done to limit the amount of knowledge any one person would have? So no one dishonest scribe could dig up all the treasure? Well, perhaps. In fact, it is estimated there were a hundred priests working on the project of burying the treasures split into teams of 25 each. That way, if moral failure occurred or if someone broke down during a Babylonian torture, only a quarter of the treasure would be at risk. Now, two of these men were Zechariah and Haggai, the prophets. They returned after the Babylonian captivity and helped the Israelites build the second temple. So, did they dig up these treasures? It appears they did not. You see, when the Israelites built the second temple, they complained to Haggai the prophet that the second temple was nothing like the former glory of Solomon's temple. To which Haggai replied, Once more, in a little while, I, and he's speaking for God here, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, Haggai is telling us that the house will be filled with glory once God shakes the heavens and the earth again, and silver and gold will be brought into the house. Haggai did not run down to the secret site where the gold of Solomon's temple was hidden and dig it up. He left it because he knew it was meant for the Messiah. So we know from multiple ancient documents that Jeremiah the prophet was in charge of hiding the treasures of Solomon's temple prior to the Babylonian invasion and that he used five men to organized teams of priests to actually do the hiding. And then we also learn from these documents that they inscribed the whereabouts of the treasure on a copper scroll. Pretty interesting stuff. We then learn from the Bible itself that it is likely that these treasures were not dug back up. And then in 1952, a copper scroll that matches the description of what we learn in these ancient historical documents was found. A literal treasure map. And it was found in a secret room behind a false wall. So what do we have to do to get the treasures out of the ground? So where are those treasures located? Where is that secret cave? And what exactly is hidden there? Believe it or not, I think we know. If you want to keep watching to find out more about this fascinating biblical mystery, just click right here. If the video hasn't been published yet, this is a great opportunity to subscribe to our channel and click the bell notification. And in that way, as soon as that video comes out, you'll be notified. This is Nelson, and I'll see you there.